All right, everybody, welcome to our latest virtual bourbon event. My name is Steve Akeley. We are going to be doing a tasting today led by Wes Harden of a 1976 Early Times from a, a Dusty Decanter versus the modern day Bottled and Bond Early Times. We're going to do a side-by-side -side comparison. And best of all, it's a blind comparison as well. So you're not going to know going into it which is which, and you guys are going to have to be guessing which one it is. We did have some difficulties getting the samples out. I don't even have the samples myself. So... Uh, I was going to be playing along. I don't get to play along. I'll be on the next one. We're going to do this again, and I will be drinking next time, but I think I'll have the code broken where I'll know what <laughs> So, well, what are you going to do? But it'll be fun tonight because we're going to truly be going in blind, and it should be good. So with that, I'd like to introduce Wes Harden. Wes, how you doing, man? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, good. So, good. Uh, I mean, I think we always like to get into history and things like that before we get to the blind tasting. Yep. And uh, there's a lot of history here to tell. And, and you know, kind of the more I was digging in, the more I realized was there. Uh, if you just look at one article, you're not going to get the whole story. you got to go to several. So I did that. So I don't know how much you've got, Wes, but uh, you can yeah. you can kick it off and I can, I can, I can fill it because it's kind of your event, but uh, I'll, yeah. I'll help out if you need it. Okay. Yeah, I actually, uh, I actually wrote an article about uh, the early times uh, brand okay. for the for the for the blog here a few months ago. So I'm going to pull from some of that. So uh, pre-prohibition uh, time frame, uh, like a ton of other distilleries and a ton of other brands, uh, this was originally a uh, uh, an arm of the Beam family. So uh, Jack Beam, at the age of 21, uh, left his uh, uncle's distillery he branched out on his own he actually started early times uh, built a brand new distillery in Bardstown uh, so he used some of the modern techniques of the time and it became a pretty popular uh, brand he did that in 1860 so yes early times goes all the way back to 1860 and he it was family relation just to get thrown in there uh, he was actually Jim Beam's uncle so yes yes he was Jim Beam's uncle uh, Jack so it, it's kind of interesting that whole it's a you get another oh, branched yeah. off arm I'm of the Bean that, family. That's a book by itself. Just Bean Family Tree is that's the book. Not you know, there's books about Bean Family and all that, but I'm just the, the tree and then what each person did and contributed to bourbon. I'd love to just read that. Absolutely. So we had, uh, throughout the years, he uh, he like a lot of people, he sold the distillery and the brand, and and the property and the distillery changed hands. It finally ended up in the hands of a guy named S. L. Guthrie. Uh, and he continued to uh, produce a ton of bourbon uh, all the way up until Prohibition. Uh, so at, along with uh, most distilleries, uh, they ended up having to, uh, they, did, they did not get their medicinal license. However, they sold the company to Brown Foreman, who did have a medicinal license. So, they, so Brown Foreman bought all of that whiskey, uh, sold it during Prohibition. Yep. Uh, they shut down uh, the distillery in Bardstown. Uh, and after repeal, they began production of the Early Times Bourbon and their distillery in Shively, which at the time was called the Old Kentucky Distillery. Yeah, uh, and, and apparently Brown Forum being one of the licensee, uh, the holders being able to sell medicinal whiskey, they actually did some good with Early Times, and, and they created demand for that brand post-prohibition. So uh, yeah. it wasn't really widely a, a call brand before that. And they did okay. Uh, Jack Bean, you know, made a good living off of that and that. But but it really became a brand people started asking for after Prohibition. So it, it became kind of a big deal. And and yeah, they bought the company as well as the, the existing stock. So yep. you, know, you could just buy existing stock. And but you know, most people figured Prohibition is never going to go away. So why even hold on to a company? So that was the, so proud for about the whole thing. Yep, absolutely. So they uh, after Prohibition. Uh, that brand grew to uh, basically one of the best, and you know, records are a little strange, but there were some years there in the, uh, the 40s and 50s where early times bourbon, believe it or not, uh, was the best-selling bourbon brand in America. Yes. Uh, in 1953, they actually, it was so popular, in, in 1953, Brown Foreman changed the name of that uh, old Kentucky distillery to the early times distillery. So the, the distillery sure. name changed uh, along with it. And part of their their rise in popularity was uh, it was uh, it was a mash bill. Early times was a mash bill that was actually lower rye, so it didn't have wheat in it. It was still a rye mash bill, uh, but it was a little bit of a lower uh, mash bill that was pretty popular after World War II. So as all the Americans went over to Europe and they were drinking wine and brandy and kind of got the, the taste of that sweetness, a lot of the uh, a lot of the American distilleries started. Uh, 
reducing some of that high rye content to kind of uh, make bourbon a little more approachable to uh, to people. So they were uh, they were the top brand in '53. You kind of know what caused their downfall. That's really started two years later. Two years later, after '53. Yeah, after '53. So two years later, 1955. What would cause their downfall was the purchase of Jack Daniels. Right. And, and you know, that was a, a, a huge brand, you know, with, with a lot of upside and a lot of those marketing dollars that were being spent on early times to make that a thing, now we're suddenly being funneled away from the, the new kid in the portfolio, Jack Daniels brand. So, yep. yeah, so. This, and then the 70s hit, we know what happened in the 70s and into the 80s, bourbon history bottoms out. This will be a, a common theme in a lot of our dusty uh, history uh, events we do. Uh, and so, you know, Brown Foreman made the decision uh, from a cost cutting standpoint, uh, they, they did, they, they made quite a drastic change to the brand. Uh, so the first thing they did was, uh, it's, it was no longer a bourbon. They started aging it in used barrels. So it became a whiskey, a straight yep. whiskey. Uh, it was basically average age on it was maybe three years max. It was a very, uh, a very lightly aged uh, uh, American whiskey and used barrels. Of course, they had to create new branding for that. So the new name for it was early times, old style Kentucky whiskey, which is a bit of a mouthful, a mouthful there. Uh, and so they basically gave up on it. They also cut it down from 100 proof to 80. So you, you do a combination of three years or less aging, and now it's not even a bourbon. It's a, it's a straight whiskey, and you take it from 100 to 80 proof it's a bottom shelfer and it's set on the bottom shelf uh, for the next 30 years or so until uh, 2017. Did you know Wes, I, I don't know if you caught this or not, but they always called it outside the US, which is which is a thing that I hate. It's a pet peeve of mine that there's these rules that have to be to followed to be called bourbon in the US. You don't always necessarily have to follow them uh, if you are a distiller, if you're selling it outside the US. I think it should, in proof and labeling, it should, uh, qualify for even if it's not regulated by that co by that country, it should follow under our rules, and we should uh, you know always have the same. You shouldn't be able to go to Australia and buy a seventy proof uh, you know bourbon, but uh, you can. Uh, and and in this example, even put in those used barrels, they always sold early times as a bourbon. So yeah, and, and you find a lot of special runs or anything. It was the exact same stuff they're selling in the U.S. They just sold it as bourbon uh, uh, in Japan, where it was a, a good seller actually. Yeah, in Germany, so there's a couple of European countries that, uh, not so much anymore, but back in in those days, what they would do is they would actually import uh, the whiskey in the barrel. Uh -huh. and they would do their own bottling and, and, and overseas. And so anytime you see a dusty bottle that has this weird looking uh, twist cap on top that's different from, it's not a cork, it almost is so strange it looks fake. Like when you see the bottle and the cap, like right. immediately think that's a that's a fake. If it's a if it's an export specifically into Germany, and they do a little bit of uh, you see those in Austria and some other places like that. Uh, those are those are typically bottles. And if you look at the label on the back, uh, the English translation, it'll say bottled in Germany or bottled in Austria or bottled wherever. They would buy those barrels, bring them over. And to your point, Steve, they would do whatever the hell they wanted to with them. They would label yeah. them however they want to. They didn't have the tax strips or any of that stuff. So. One of the things they did uh, at times, especially in Japan, because they have, uh, they really don't have the palates at the time of, to, to handle a stronger whiskey. So, uh, yeah, they would, uh, they have these weird, you know, 89.1 proof or 80.2 proof, all these really weird proofs up to your point under 80 in some cases. Yeah. 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 So it's, uh, it, uh, it lingered on the bottom shelf. Uh, in the early 2000s, they, they made some sort of a attempt to maybe bring back uh, the bourbon. Uh, it was called Early Times 354. It was basically sold in export markets. It, it bombed. It really didn't sell very well at all. And they totally shelled that bourbon in 2014. So there's about a 10 to 12 year span where there's these uh, weird looking um, street bourbon uh, early times 354 bottles. I've seen one. I've never tried one, uh, but those were lingering out there. The market didn't take to it. Not even they did, the they did for a few bucks at, at marketing to make uh, early times the official whiskey of the mint julep. Uh, they for, did. Yeah, which uh, is weird, right? Uh, for, yeah. It, basically yeah. regulating the bottom shelf and then being like, well, you know, it's official whiskey of the Kentucky Derby, which is a big deal. So, 
Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was. It was a really popular bottom shelfer. I mean, at eighty proof and aged in used barrels, you know, it's a totally watered down, you know, light, uh, light flavored whiskey. So, you know, people that you know want to be able to drink a lot of it on the cheap, then it was a pretty popular bottom shelfer. But uh, yeah, yeah, I was it, surprised, Wes. So it uh, it currently is the seventh largest unflavored whiskey in the world. So just with not bourbon or anything, but just yep. a, a whiskey, American whiskey, it's the seventh largest, which is not, not bad. I mean, no, it's not bad. So the uh, Brown Foreman, uh, bur the bourbon boom comes back and the, you could argue when it was to me, it was 08, 09, 010 kind of thing. You know, we really started getting back into bourbon popularity. In 2017, uh, Brown Foreman decided to bring it back. So to me, it was really cool. So they brought it back as a Kentucky straight bourbon. They brought it back bottled in bond, so it's minimum four year. It's now a bourbon. It's not a. It's not a whiskey. And what's really cool is the MSRP is about twenty three ninety nine, twenty four bucks, and it's only available in a liter size bottle. So now you get more. You get a bigger right. bang for your buck. Uh, it's a. It's to me. It's not a bottom shelfer anymore. It's a great daily drinker uh, type of thing. And so, you know, the, the, the newest information on the brand is what Steve talked about a few weeks ago. Sazerac announced uh, they purchased the, uh, the brand and labels from uh, Brown Foreman. So we'll see what the, the Sazerac people do. I'm hoping yeah. that they, uh, I'm hoping they treat it right. And they uh, maybe uh, try to bring it back to its uh, post-prohibition glory. And uh, I'm hoping they don't uh, it, it, reverse yeah. the effects and make it a bottom shelf for again. It feels like it, that that brand to me, and I'm telling you from being in, in all these Facebook groups and stuff like that, it seemed like the early times was really catching on as being a popular, you know, great value bourbon. Yeah. Not, not to say that's going to be number one by any means, but but when people do like to focus on value bourbons, and that likes to be on the regular, and that one, it just seems like more and more people were finding that because I, I would see people talking about it. Hey, I found it at this store and stuff like that. So I, I think there was some real energy that was going on with the brand and it's just, it seemed like a weird time to, to sell it. Yeah. When it, when they, we, they reintroduced that in 2017, it had had 30 years of being just a really not good bottom shelf whiskey. It's not even a bourbon. And, it, and you know, it took them a year or so to start gaining, regaining that momentum. And I know here locally, most of the liquor stores, you have Brown Foreman reps and they were giving out, you know, free tastings to kind of get people, hey, taste this stuff. It's not what you think it is. It's not your granddad's uh, early times uh, type of thing. Uh, I feel, I, I'm, I'm with you, Steve, in the last year, year and a half, that bottle is starting to become what the Heaven Hill six-year-old right. bottled bond was. It was a, uh, it, it drank older than its age. It's super, super value. You can't get it everywhere. It does have more distribution than just Kentucky, but can't find it like it's not sitting on every True. shelf yeah. even here but everywhere it's not sitting so it's a little bit elusive but if you find one you get a liter bottle it's 24 bucks uh and it tastes great and it's a it was a brown foreman uh product which they've been as they've been as hot with quality products the last six seven eight years as anyone has yeah yeah, my understanding is with the, the purchase of the name, they also purchased some stock. So uh, I would think in the very short term, so we're talking the next several years, maybe since it's a bottle of bond, maybe the next four years, uh, I don't anticipate any changes in that because they're going to be utilizing the inventory that they bought with the brand purchase. Now, long term, it will then switch over at some point to Sazerac's product. And then where do we go from there? I don't know. But Sazerac, you know, Buffalo Trace makes some some great whiskey. So it could be as equal as or as better than it is right now. But uh, time will tell. Well, so that you just mentioned something that's going to become a, a pet project of mine is I, I'm, I'm really big on uh, same whiskey, same mash bill, same type of steel. How does it compare A to B? So I'm, I'm going to uh, I'll hold back a couple of bottles of these. And whenever the Sazerac version right. of it comes out. I would I, I would love to do a side by side blind, assuming that it's still a four year bottled bond, same mash bill, assuming all that's the same, where it's more of an apples to apples comparison. That's that's the real way, in my opinion, to determine what's Brown Foreman doing versus what's Sazerac doing in those distilleries. And there's a whole lot of things, the way they warehouse, the way they age, you know, the whole nine yards. But it's it would be an interesting side by side four or five years from now. Yeah. I, the brand is in good hands. I mean, Sazerac, 
I mean, they do things right. I mean, I was just there today at Buffalo Trace, and man, it, that place just gets better and better. And they've got this new event center now. It's a bad time to have an event center, uh, but they've got this new event center up the hill where where you know people, uh, dignitaries, people who are buying barrels and stuff like that, and it overlooks you know the whole distillery and stuff. Like, it looks like a cool. We didn't get to go up in there, but it looks like a very cool place. Of course, they just redid the gift shop. They their tasting rooms which are very cool now, almost like they're made for COVID. They weren't, they were designed for that. They, they were designed really as a noise reduction thing. They're saying when they're doing their tastings, uh, multiple tastings gets too loud. So they, they're all in like private rooms, which it seems like it was made for COVID because you know you, you, there was four different tastings going on when I was there because you can only have eight people on a tour, but they're all private, quiet, they're all separated. You know, So you have the distancing that you need in today's times built in with that new setup they've got. So they, 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 they do things right, that's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's uh, that's kind of the the quick Reader's Digest version of early times. It's another one of those brands that uh, I'm intrigued by these brands that were at the top of their game and fell from grace over the years, and some are trying to make a comeback and some are not. This is one of the ones that uh, I think has made a, a pretty good comeback so far in its short uh, yes. rebirth. And the rest of the story is to be told. So we'll we'll see what really? happens. It, this could be the best thing that ever happened to that brand, and we'll, but or it could be bad. I, we'll see. Um, with that, Wes, I'd like to turn it over to you. You're, we'll have you lead the tasting again. This is a blind tasting, and I happen to yep. see the samples. Bill's, I didn't, I didn't get my own, but Bill sent me a photo of the samples today. So I guess it looks like you just got a blind color coded. It looked like. Uh, in yeah, the, I did. Uh, I color coded. Yeah, I color coded with uh, with tape. A the tape prevents them or helps prevent them from leaking in transit. Uh, but it was uh, it was a way to help me keep organized when I was pouring all of those. Uh, so how many did get their samples? I know Rick didn't. Very did good. Get his. One, two, got his. Three, three samples. Okay, perfect. Three samples. So let's. So uh, what? So between the two samples, everyone got. A, and this is just literally. I ran out of one color tape and had to use two. Everyone got a, gets a has a bottle with a blue tape. So it's blue tape, or you either have a yellow or a white. They're the same thing. So. If someone picks up one, someone's got a yellow one, the other person has a white, they're the exact same thing. So the okay. blue is constant. Uh, I had plenty of blue tape, but I ran out of, uh, I think it was white, and had to use some yellow. So um, I think uh, for those of us who have the whiskey, let's start with, uh, let's start with the blue first. And I'm going to shut my video off real quick while I do this so you can't Ooh, see. You can't see the magic. It's about to happen. Magic. Can't see the uh, the magic here. Right now you're still on. You can't see anything going on though, right? I did, I did just see your phone. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. We need music for this part. <laughs> there you go. That's good. Very nice. All right. All right. Uh, you guys, whoever's got the whiskey, you guys go ahead and let's nose it and see what you guys think of what you get here. I'm going to let you guys tell me what you see. I mean, I know what it is, obviously, because I'm pouring it here and I have to know for obvious reasons, but what are you guys getting on the nose there? You get a lot of baking spice right up front. Yep. yep. I, uh, it's, uh, reminds me of like a banana bread almost. Mm. It's a, uh, it's a very, uh, it's like a, yeah, like a banana bread. It's like a fruit baking spice kind of, you know, baking. <laughs> bananas foster. There you go. Rick. We'll get the bananas foster. Right there. Yes. Anybody it's opened else? up a lot since I've um, since I poured it. it. It does seem to open up a little bit more. Um, and, and my first nose, uh, you know, I nose both of them, but the first one really has opened up a whole lot more for me. Um, you know, I, I agree with the spices, the baking spices. Barry, by the way, uh, everybody get out and support Barry. He uh, he owns William Tarr Distillery, which is a new distillery in Lexington. Ah. I haven't been there yet, but he's a regular on these events and stuff like that. Matter of fact, I knew him from the events before I knew he was ever involved in that. We, we had a deal where he, a little shipment late to him, and uh, I was trying to look him up there, and I was like, wait a minute. 
This is the berry that has the distillery. Wait, it's the same I, knew, I knew the name sound familiar. Yeah, I, yeah, remember, I remember Christie's article. So, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So Thank you. Congratulations, Thank you. man. Congratulations. Thank you. C come and see us. Oh, yeah. I'm going to, I'll be there. Don't worry. Yeah, no, that's cool. I'll All right. I'm going to go ahead and take a taste here. If anybody else has any more nosing uh, comments, please give them. Any comments on taste there from anyone? You get a ton of caramel right up front. Yep, very sweet. Um, very sweet. It's a good. It's a. You, you get that. I get the sweetness on the front. I get the the banana really comes through big on the back end for me, and it's got a nice little Kentucky hug that kind of follows all the way through. Like it's not weak, and then it hits you. To me, it's like from the start, you get like a nice, not anything overpowering. It's a nice Kentucky hug. It kind of sticks mm. with you a little bit in the throat. Yeah. Bananas yeah, I really, I really get that banana in the back. It seems to be pretty consistent with the brown Foreman products. I always get it on Old Foe. Obviously, the regular Jack Daniels tastes very bananas to me. Uh, and then you're saying this is catching some bananas too. It's very common with their products. Yeah, I get a little more of that, uh, almost like a cornbread too, like a not so much. It's like a almost like a sweet cornbread too. On I gotta go back and nose it again, but it's probably that banana yeah. bread. It's good stuff. How do you guys like that sample? So that was good. It. Help us yeah. out here for those that don't have samples. It's good. That the blue one is good. We're saying. Yeah, I like the blue one. I uh, absolutely. It's a. Uh, it's a unique, it's a unique flavor. It's not, uh, you don't, I mean, it's got some similarities to some things you have today, but it's a, it's a little unique to me. It's got a nice balance of sweetness and, and kind of that earthy, you know, bread yeast kind of thing going on. Yeah. And I think, you know, you had talked a little bit about the, that Kentucky hug. I enjoy that. I enjoy that, oh, yeah. heat. you know, the, the spice notes that you get kind of mid palate, but, it's not overpowering. You know, it's not a really high proof, but you certainly do get some of those um, more more hot spices. Yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of of the, of a good heat in Kentucky hug where it's flavorful, not just like not just to be hot. Like there's some bourbons that you know it doesn't to me. It's not impressive for a bourbon to be cast strength at 128 proof if it's all ethanol and just burns out your palate, like that, there's no use in that. But if you can get that with uh, a nice spice or cinnamon or like a caramel or some flavor, then it just kind of like, it allows it just to kind of just coat your whole throat and palate. And it's a, it's the best experience, but being hot to be hot is not a benefit to me. I mean, if right. you want to do that, just go out and, you know, grab something high proof, neutral spirits and have Everclear. that. Everclear. Get the old yeah, exactly. Grab your Everclear and go for it. Take yourself back to college. <laughs> All right, you guys want to try the other sample? Yeah. This would be the yellow or the white. I'm going to move my screen down for a second here. Excellent. Magic is happening. Magic. Steve, you ought to tell some nice story while we're doing this. <laughs> so. <laughs> Good stories. I've got a good story. Uh, I guess I could say this. Royce Neely's getting ready to open up a second distillery. So how about that? Wow. Wow. That's, how about a, that's that? a scoop. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be uh, kind of on the way to where he grew up. He grew up in uh, Osley County, Kentucky. It's not in Osley County, but it's uh, on the way there. There's this kind of a very touristy area where there's you do a lot of outdoor activities like kayaking and stuff like that. But then they've got all kinds of gift shops restaurants, old time things, almost like you're, you're going to a, 
uh, Gatlinburg or Silver Dollar City area, Branson area, uh, all these old things like a you know, snake pit, come in and gift shop and then where there's a snake pit and all this old time marketing stuff, pizza places too and stuff like that. And uh, they're going to be opening up a Neely Mountain Distillery, which is kind of cool. And Could they're going to focus on only or? I'm going to focus on the moonshine. They will sell their bourbon there, but they will be distilling moonshine on site and then uh, selling it there as well. So is, uh, is that to give them the capacity to do more bourbon in one and more moonshine in the other instead of having um, the flip-flopper. I, I think it's just the, the love for Osley County and where they grew gotcha. up. Their family, gotcha. even though this isn't exactly where their family from, that's where they would spend all their fun family time. You know, gotcha. up, you know Roy, when he was growing up, they would go to this area um, and, and hang out and, 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 you know, family reunions there and stuff like that. So they're, they're doing it as a tribute to that. And they, they have the capacity to do that, especially with it being moonshine focused. If it was bourbon focused, uh, that'd be tough for them to add on because they're right now they're struggling just to keep up with what they've got distribution wise. But uh, something that is moonshine focused, you know, that's something that they could service right now under their current thing. Most of the moonshine will be made at the other distillery and shipped in, but they will be making some on site. So it'll be a kind of cool. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, I'm really, really happy for them. I mean, things are good. Yeah, good deal. All right, guys, everybody got their second one poured. Let's nose this thing and see what we think. So I've got my opinion of this pretty quickly. It hit me pretty hard in the face. I'll see what you guys think. This is kind of exciting. I wish I had my whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty interesting. It's almost like it's almost like when you were a kid and you had like right, a friend yeah. over and you're like watching them play the video game. And you're right. like, Man, it looks like it's fun. Damn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> what are you guys get getting a, on the nose? You know, some like citrus, like orange. Okay. Bills. Maybe, and, but it's yes sweet. Yeah. Very sweet though. Very sweet. Nose. Super sweet. Yeah. I got I got a really heavy my first nose, I got a really heavy, almost like a butterscotch bomb. Okay. Like uh kind of like a um, it's butterscotch, but I got I got some of that caramel. It's almost like a it smelled like a wow. word. It's one of your favorites, Steve, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> I, it's, it's mandatory. Yeah, that's right, it's mandatory. Like you you, you yeah. keep a you keep a pocket full at all times. Sure, right? sure, sure. I mean, that's it. <laughs> Barry, what do you got? A what you got on there? I, I'm I'm getting you know a lot of candied. I, I'm still getting some banana on this too, but okay. you know I, I'm I'm definitely getting a sweet aroma. Yeah, it's it's a uh, really sweet. And as I go back and nose it again, yeah, it's it's I, it still hits me as like a like that butterscotch Werther's mm. kind of sweetness yeah. to me. It really hits me pretty hard, actually. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna go taste mine. Tastes like that too. Mm. Yep. That is get, wonderful. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's mm. it's a lot different than the first sample to me. Uh, I will say that the the finish is not near as long for me. Um, yeah. It's uh, it it has it has a nice Kentucky head. Like it's not weak or anything like that, but it's it's not quite the. It doesn't maybe and maybe it's because it doesn't have the spice, so that combination yeah. of the spice and the hug don't go as long. Uh, yeah. Very sweet, but man, this stuff is, this stuff is. If you like a sweet bourbon, this is this is some pretty good stuff. Yeah, that's uh. I get both that banana and that uh, butterscotch when I'm drinking. It's kind of a, you know, kind of a fruit sweetness combination. Yeah, I'm not getting the um, the, the the hot spicy notes like the first one, but it, it's it's a wonderful. I, I love a, a weeded bourbon, and yep. um, I, this is right in my flavor profile. Yeah, it reminds it reminds you of it reminds me of like a. Uh, almost like a Weller special reserve mm -hmm. kind of type of thing. You know, it's got that sweetness. It has a little, it has a little more depth, I think, than that. <laughs> but, uh, oh, there you go right there. He's going to do a side bus. Oh, or he's going to drink that. bananas before he grabbed the bananas. For, I, who knows what else Tim's got there. It's, it's, <laughs> everything's ready to go. Paul, what do you think of this? There we are. 
Yeah, it's very sweet. I get like vanilla, almost yeah. like um, yeah, lots of vanilla and super sweet, but yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah, now that I'm nosing it again, I do get like that uh, orange peel or orange zest on the nose too. I think I can't remember who said that, but that, I do, just, I do yeah, get some of that too. That's what I picked up right yeah. away. That's what hit me first. All right, that's good stuff too. Both to me, both samples are excellent. I would, uh, I would drink any of those if. Well, I do have some, but I would drink any of those any day of the week. They're they're pretty good. So we got three drinkers here. Yep. I think we need to ask: Do you like the blue or the yellow white combo? It could be one of the others here. So, uh, let's. I like see. them both. Uh, the first okay. sample, the blue sample. Um, it had more of a full mouth fill from the very beginning. And the second sample, it's got a good mouth fill, but it's like in stages. It doesn't overwhelm you. It doesn't, it's, it's not as strong as the first one. It doesn't have as much of a full flavor as the first one. Okay. Which one do you like better if you had what, to choose? Yeah, what's your, what, what has the slight edge? I like them both, but I'd go with the, the first one. Okay. So it's a vote for blue, correct? Blue, blue goes up one zip. All right. All right. Paul, you're next. I totally agree. I like them both, but if I had to pick one, I think I'd go with the blue. Blue. Okay. okay. Blue, blue's up two nothing. It's going to win uh, our, our thing because we only have three voting, but we're still going to ask Barry to weigh in on this. It's like the uh, watching Big Brother <laughs> show. Sorry, well, it's a pleasure. Uh, sorry. We're going to make it unanimous. Um, okay. I think for me, number one hits all of the notes that I really like. I enjoy a um, more of a barrel proof. Um, this one hits the, those spicy notes, even though it's not a high proof. Um, it's a little bit more complex, but that's taking nothing away from number two because I'm really enjoying number two. One gets the edge because of the um, more complexity of it. Complexity, okay. All right. Complexity and oof. all right. Wes, what is what? All right, so the good news is uh, you guys all pick the same one, so that means it was pretty consistently the winner. Uh, the other thing you'll be happy about is it's something you can still get on the market today because that, that is the 2017 bottled bond. So really, nice. uh, a combination of during the uh, the history portion, more of the excerpts were uh, that the early times in the 50s uh, had that lower rye mash bill and between that and it's 80, this uh, this canteen or this decanter was a 86 proof. So you yeah. had the combination what of the lower proof there, and yeah. the lower rye. That's the difference in the hug and the spice. Otherwise, it, it, it to me the difference in the two are what do you feel like drinking that day? Do you or is it a hot day? To me, the the decanter is one of those like wonderful. Everyone says, oh, you can't drink bourbon when it's 90 degrees outside. You can. You probably can't drink Stag or Stag Junior. But find you a good, flavorful 86 or 90 proof Dusty or something like that or, or something that's on the market at 86 or 90 proof. Uh, that's, a, that's almost like a, what I call a refreshing bourbon. It's sweet. It's a dessert bourbon, you know, that type of thing. Uh, it, but if you're, if you're a, a chilly spring or fall or winter and you're outside at the fire pit, man, it's going to be hard to beat that, uh, especially for the price. It's going, to be, it's going to be hard to beat that early times bottle and bond. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, Wes, you don't have the decanter there still, do you? No, it is uh, it is in someone's possession. I can't remember who won it from the randomizer. Remember, I shipped it out with the sample. So, yeah. so, so that's going to be your new thing, too. Uh, yep. All these, when you do decanters, you're going to give away the decanter. Whatever. Yep. We uh, will run a randomizer for every event uh, that, that I'm a part of. And whoever wins the randomizer uh, will get that decanter to do whatever they want to with, put on their bar back. Put it uh, decoration. It was, it was, Paul uh, make a lamp out of it. Yeah, they could do whatever they want. Uh, it was like a Spirit of '76 type of design, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was the state of Ohio, if I'm not okay. mistaken. It was yeah. either Illinois or Ohio. I can't remember which one, but it was. I think it was Ohio. Ohio. Okay. Okay. Very cool. And then you've got uh, a couple more events coming up too. Yeah. Uh, so the next one is uh, the next two are pretty unique. So they they you start uh, start getting into the, the bourbon dusty rabbit hole with these two. So the first one, the first two that I've been a part of, we did Old Commonwealth, uh, which is pretty well known. And then obviously early times, everyone knows of early times. The next one is uh, for anybody that's uh, 
that's in Missouri, they will definitely uh, know it's a McCormick. Yep. Uh, I don't remember exactly the year. I have to look and see, but it's a, it's a seventies McCormick. Uh, they ran a series of like uh, paying homage to some of the great American heroes. So this one happens to be a Betsy Ross decanter. Yep. Also from uh, 1976. Obviously. 76. There you go. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, September 21st. That one is. There you go. So that's, uh, that's the Betsy Ross. That's the next one. That's uh, in September. I think it's the 20. First, I can't remember which the date off the top of my head. September twenty. Uh, so, yes, September twenty. Okay, there you go. Perfect. So that uh, one, uh, that one's going to be a cool one. That's uh, McCormick's you know, interesting because they've been around forever, and they, nobody knows. I mean, most people, I didn't know until I started knows, digging. I always think it. spices. Yeah, they made it through the worst of the bourbon times, just yeah. making stuff, and they're they're still out there today. They don't have public tours or anything. Um, I know someone who knows uh, somebody there, and I'm trying to get in that way trying to uh, allow them to get oh, that's cool tour, so um but you know, they don't do public tours so but uh, they're of, of great interest so they also yeah. they source quite a bit but then they do come out with their own stuff like you see these old decanters and things like that and some brands they've had in the past and that so yeah they're, they're yeah they uh, that uh, that bj holiday brand was a mccormick yeah. distilled uh brand so that was pretty cool it's uh it gives us a chance to uh dusty's outside of made outside of the state of Kentucky, Indiana, or, or Tennessee, or not very, there's not a lot of distill, older distilleries around that were making uh, bourbon back in those days outside of those, you know, and you add Illinois because they had the big uh, distillery in Peoria. There's, it's hard to find things from outside of uh, those general mid-south states that, uh, uh, that are that old, but uh, McCormick, uh, they, they've made a bunch of whiskey back in the day. And so it's interesting to see uh, what that's going to taste like. Uh, and it's just something oddball. And I think the history of it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. And then October 1st, uh, we have a really cool one. It's another oddball brand. Uh, but when we get into the history portion of it, it's going to take you right back to uh, uh, a really uh, proficient uh, old uh, distillery that no longer produces, but uh, is still a pretty big historic distillery. And the, the brand is uh, Old Mr. Boston. And so that one's going to be a really cool history because uh, that brand is actually tied to a couple of different distilleries over the years. Uh, and spoiler alert, one was in Kentucky and one was not. So uh, it's just another one of those brands not a lot of people have heard of. And uh, when I started digging into it, it was... Uh, it was pretty cool to kind of track all that stuff down. So I think those two would be uh, pretty cool. The, the whiskey tasting is going to be cool, but I think the education part of it is going to be pretty cool too. Cool. And then you are going to help us out on uh, September 27th. Oh, yeah. Yes, we're doing a uh, Dusty's event. It's going to be at Neely Family Distillery. They've got that new visitor center. So we're utilizing that kind of as our training uh, grounds right now. Small classroom size. So it's only uh, 10 people in there. And uh, it's going to be you and Jason Bronner are going to be partnering up and uh, talking about uh, dusty hunting and how do you find these things and all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, you know, what are they worth? You can bring in your bottles, have them evaluated price-wise, yep. stuff like that. If you've got any old dusties laying around. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get into all that good stuff. We're going to talk about uh, how, to, how to look at a label and go beyond the name of the label and dig into what distillery it came from and how to uh, – how to look at stampings on the bottom of bottles, UPC codes, tax strips, and try to identify at least uh, close to what year it came out. You can, we're going to get into all of those uh, dusty 101 identification, where people are finding these things at, how do you get them, and, and, and even down to once I have one, how do I decant it to where I don't have crap in it and cork breaks off, and all those little tips and tricks, we'll get into all that. Yeah, that'll, that'll all be good stuff. Uh, you also get a couple of Dusties. So we've got uh, beam decanters from the 60s, so from the uh, late 60s, uh, which are cool. A lot of those were distilled in the 50s. So that's that's pretty cool stuff. And then we've got a blended whiskey one, too, that's in an old uh, Leroy Neiman decanter from 1979. So interesting stuff. Should be a fun class. Uh, we're going to be tasting all kinds of Dusties. You also get some to go as well because we're, we're going to have more, more than you can, uh, than we'd want to do in one tasting. So a uh, great opportunity to try some. And all the, the Dusty tastings we're going to do, we're going to do side by side with, like Wes did here with the current version of, of that. So we've got like some 1976 wild turkey uh, from a Dusty that we're going to compare to 
current Wild Turkey 101. So all will be side by side, which is a, a cool way to do it. So I'd like to see some of you guys in there if you can. Um, with that, it's your time. Questions? Anything you want to ask about this uh, early times, history, uh, the brand, dusty hunting, urban industry in general? Uh, Wes writes a lot of different things, so he knows a lot. So feel free to ask anything you like. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's anything else. Anything else you undercovered about? Early times. I was trying to see if I if there's anything you missed. Yeah, I try to hit the the higher points just without getting too super uh, nerdy about it. I mean, obviously, any of the bourbon history before the 1900s is sketchy at best, and uh, it's uh you're relying on the memory and writing ability of people that lived a hard life and drank a lot of whiskey. So yeah, at the time you kind of question what happened and what didn't happen, but I. I I feel like uh, all the information I dug up is pretty universally accepted as uh, canon for early times. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, my it's a speech has brand. a pretty comprehensive article where I pulled a lot of my, not everything, but I pulled a lot of it from, uh, he did it when it, with, when the purchase. So he went and did like a full review of, of early times. Uh, one other thing that I thought was interesting that um, family tragedy and, and could have very well changed what happened with this brand, but they, no one said how they passed away, but both father and son uh, passed away in 1915. So, um, and again, the distillery ended up closing in 1918, a year before regular prohibition, but they got closed down for wartime prohibition. So they had to help the war effort. So they actually yeah. closed in 1918, helped make some supplies uh, for World War One, And then by 1919, no, regular prohibition had kicked in and then they were out of business. And like the guy you mentioned ended up being the guy who sold the story. But yep. Uh, both Jack and his son passed away in 19, and not at the same time. So it wasn't like an accident or something like that where, you know, car accident where they're both killed. They're both just both happened to die in the same year, which is odd for a father and son not killed tragically like that. So, but I, th no one said what caused it. So, yeah, I remember reading that, but I, I'm with you. I didn't see any kind of, didn't uh, see, right, any right. kind of cause or anything. They just said they both quote unquote tragically died within a yeah. certain amount of time of each other. Yeah. yeah. Wes, you know, there, there was a lot of um, turmoil and strife way back then. And, it, you know, it, it seems like the, uh, the, the whiskey business back in the 1865s up to, um, to Prohibition, um, it, it seemed like there was great strides and then tragedy, you know, yep. befell people. You know, so, so when you look, at, um, you, you look at the turnover of these distilleries, you know, this, this whiskey trust was buying up all of these different distilleries. Oh, but yeah you know, there, there was just so many people that were struggling and, and doing well one moment and then going through depression and, and needing to sell off because they've lost everything they own, you know, so it was a, it was a very traumatic time um, when you lead into a prohibition and a whole lot of consolidation was going on with all of those um, distilleries around. Yeah, that the, the post uh, recession time period of 08, 09, 10, uh, the, the big time banks that swooped in and, and absorbed all these other banks, and all this debt. And, and it's like a lot of the big hitters had to combine with other big hitters to create these global banking, uh, consortiums It's very similar to what happened in the whiskey industry during the time period that you were talking about where, you know, you had all these different distilleries and the ones that survived prohibition, once it started back up after prohibition and then when they and everything started kind of going down with the introduction of clear spirits and so forth all of a sudden the four or five big guys went and bought all of this uh, all these distilleries and brands and you know they did all the things they cut them all to 80 proof and export only and all those things but it reminds me a lot of how that banking industry did similar things uh post-recession when uh the market went to hell and Everything. Yeah. It's it's uh it's business one oh one. It's it's probably has or is going to hit every industry at some point in our lifetimes and our fathers and grandfathers' lifetimes. But whiskey's been on a pretty up and down ride from when it started as being the first uh like the primary government funding is taxing all the way through it was the most popular drink in America until it was a piece of shit. Now it's back up again. And right. it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird ride, man. There's a ton of great books out there that kind of take you through 
through that ride. And, uh, Reed Mittbuehler's book is probably one of the better ones that talks about uh, how the older distilleries were bought up by the Big Five and who was the head of the Big Five. And, uh, if you haven't, I can't remember the name of the book, and I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, it's the only book he's written, but it's a pretty good comprehensive book of bourbon history in relation to the industry as a business as opposed to uh, just talking about brands. You know, it talks about whiskey, uh, bourbon as a business. It's a, it's a solid book. Right. It, that's where it makes sense where Sazerac picked up early times because of other, I, I see like early times being slid right underneath Barton Distilling Company, sitting right next to VOB on the bottom yeah. shelf because they, yeah. they lost all those barrels. So they got to buy the capacity at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. can see yeah. it right next to VOB on the shelf because VOB is hard to find it. And early times yeah. could be right there for it. So it, it makes sense maybe putting two and two together. I said yeah. they had to buy the, the capacity. And if they can buy the barrels and put a bottom shelf right there, then they keep things going with VOB going to be off the shelf for a while. You know, Tim, that's a, actually, that's a great point because yeah. I was going under this, like when someone says Sazerac, I say Buffalo Trace. Like it's just one of the two. I always forget that Barton, uh, Barton as well as uh, is Bowman in Virginia, are, are both uh, distilleries that are Sazerac owned. I don't think they would take early times and move production to Bowman in Virginia because I think they have a hard enough time keeping up with their own stuff. But I would be surprised if they don't uh, they don't put that label in. It feels like a label they would put with the Barton brand. So like Buffalo Trace seems to be kind of like like that's the distillery that's the most popular and everybody flocks to it and they want their Weller and their Pappy and their Blanton's and their Elmer T. Lee. And Barton is more of what I call, it's a, it's, it's the more cost effective, the more accessible, and it's more of like the whiskey geek, like the people that know that Barton 1792 foolproof store picks are some of the best values out there. They don't go chase a lot of that other stuff. They go find those picks. They go and, get the very old Barton 100 proof bottle and bond to, to put on their shelf and drink every day type of thing. So that's a good point. I wouldn't be surprised if that production doesn't, that production label doesn't fall under Barton. I mean, because Harlan's putting in those new, those new column stills and that all, all those new fermenters, that's, that's for the expansion of the Buffalo Trace products yep. and everything coming, all the blends and everything they just announced. That would make sense. It wouldn't surprise me if they slide this one underneath Barton and, and let Barton build back up because they got a hell of a capacity over there. Now they have all the Rick houses that fell down. They got to replenish that somehow. The only way that takes that is time. Yeah, I Barton is one of those distilleries that it's almost like uh, it's, it's it's almost out of sight, out of mind. Like you never hear anybody say, I, "I've got to go to Barton." Like, but it's a historic distillery. It's one of the longest uh, consecutively, right behind uh, Old Forester. It's one of the longest, and maybe the longest consecutively. Uh, running distillery in the U.S. as far as bourbon goes, like it's been running for a long time, and it probably has one of the largest collection of what was popular brands that are now dead. Mattingly and Moore, Tom Moore, which was the distillery name way back when, that distillery's history is very unique. I mean, you can find articles on it, but it's it, it's another it's its own rabbit hole of just like different labels, uh, and, and you're very old Barton not that long ago, back in the 90s, uh, was a eight-year age stated, 12-year age stated. Like, if you can ever find some of those dusties, that's some of the best stuff you'll you'll find anywhere. It's a, I may have to do, I may have to do something on Barton sometime. That's a good idea. I, I like the, uh, I like the intrigue with that distillery. It doesn't get a lot of press or pub. It's just kind of there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, just quick follow up. Uh, Bourbon Empire is the name of Reed. Thank you, book. thank you, thank you, thank you. I've been just being Great a good co-host here. I'm just yeah. I appreciate uh, it, man. Yeah, how about that? Uh, miracle of the. No, that's a, if you haven't read that book, I, it's one of the ones I would uh, highly suggest uh, reading. It's it's an easy read. It doesn't get super nerdy, and it's uh, it tells some <laughs> great history. There you go. There's... All right. Anything else anybody wants to add in? Okay. So again, for anybody that did not get their samples, uh, I looked at all the tracking. I, I expect that stuff's going to be there this week. Um, if you if you don't get it, or if you get it and it, they broke it, which they can do, just let me know. Uh, I still have uh, some of the dusty left over. 
uh, and I'll get you replacement samples out before we do the next follow-up. Yeah. So yeah, we're we'll, we're going to announce the next uh, date soon. So, uh, but yeah, we want to hold on just a little bit, not knowing when everybody's getting their samples in and stuff like that. So look for it uh, some information later this week, and we'll put it out there. And uh, hopefully, it works, and so you guys can attend. And I realize. That isn't what you signed up for. If uh, you signed up for this specific date, if it doesn't work out, let me know and we'll work out something on the refund. We wanna, wanna make sure everybody's happy and continues to come to our events because that's what this is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be fun. It should never be anything that causes you any aggravation or anything like that, so. Yeah, Steve and I talked before yeah. the event, we made the decision pretty quickly that from now yeah. on, just with the craziness of COVID and everything that we're gonna, uh, two weeks. We're gonna ship out two yeah. weeks at the minimum ahead of the event just to make sure because uh, yep. These went out in plenty of time, and it, it's, uh, it's one of those things that's beyond our control, but we understand it's a, a bit of a nuisance. So. Yep. Good deal. Well, that wraps up this one. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate uh, that and your patience. Thanks, guys. Out, and uh, we'll do it again soon. All right? All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks so Bye. See you guys soon. All right.